Disturbing new evidence of a serious backlog in rape investigations across the United States, the Joyful Heart Foundation has uncovered that across five major cities, there are more than 9,000 rape kits sitting in crime labs waiting to be tested. We're joined by Ilsa Connect, the Senior Advisor for Policy and Advocacy at the Joyful Heart Foundation. Ilsa, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Tell us about these findings. Are they surprising to you at all? Unfortunately, they are not surprising. We do see numbers across the country in cities of untested kits, and um, that's part of our mission is the accountability project is to uncover the real extent of the nation's rate kit backlog, and that's why we have launched this accountability project for transparency to really discover what the true extent of the backlog is. So more than 9,000 untested kits. In what cities were these again? Kansas City, San Diego, Portland, Jacksonville, and Charlotte. And so I'm wondering, you know, when you look at those kind of numbers, you think, well, what is the major challenge here? What is the issue? Is it just funding? Mm -hmm. I want to just start by saying, first of all, that we have to remember that each one of these kits does represent a sexual assault survivor. And we feel very strongly that when we're not testing these rape kits, we send a message to victims that they don't matter and their cases don't matter and what the, they experience doesn't matter. So we at the Joyful Heart Foundation want to push every city and you know localities to test every single kit because it really does matter and when you're not testing you're also sending a message to offenders that they can continue to victimize without any kind of accountability as well so resources are a huge issue of course we know that that's a problem um, we have lack of training and lack of understanding about DNA and DNA databases and how they work and how we can be using them to solve and prevent crime even in this day and age because I yes. think some people might find that surprising it is somewhat surprising um, but we still do find in, in a lot of the cities that we talk to that there are gaps in knowledge about how they can be using the database. Um, for example, we hear sometimes we wouldn't be testing acquaintance rape kit kits. And we feel very strongly that you should test those because when you do test them and put them in the database, they link to each other and you can find a serial offender that way. So acquaintance rapists are also serial rapists. We find we won't see those patterns unless we test these rape kits and get them in the database. I don't understand that. The thinking is that what? This acquaintance rapist would not necessarily be responsible for other rapists, pretend, for other rapes out there? I think it's a single focus, unfortunately, on that particular one crime. That in that instance, in that case, you might not need to test the kit for identifying the perpetrator because you know who they are. But what we do see in places that have tested all these kits, New York City is a great example of that, they linked acquaintance rape cases together and were able to prosecute the offender because of the serial nature of the cases. In New York and in Los Angeles as well, they were able to clear thousands mm -hmm. of these, these kits. Yeah. Let me ask you about the cities. I mean, how do you think they're going to respond to this kind of information, the fact that, you know, now we have the numbers of how many untested kits there are in these cities? I think that most of the cities that I've talked to, we've had a lot of conversations about the numbers and what they could be doing are already moving towards reform. Um, in one city, they actually did tell me that, you know, the Joyful Heart Foundation's uh, Freedom of Information Act request or public records request actually gave them the kick in the pants that they needed um, to make changes. Because they and didn't realize the extent of they it? They realized it, but um, it was one of those things that I think just um, was better out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are cash strapped and there are lots of resource limitations and they have cases coming in the door today. And so it was just... Um, easy in some ways to just let them keep sitting. And there have been individuals in each community that have been trying to push on this. And then when Joyful Heart has come in and asked for the numbers and pushed for accountability, it gave them uh, you know, a nice little nudge to, to move forward and make reforms. So I think a lot of these cities are going to go forward and test their kits and we're really standing ready to help them with that. Let me ask you this, because on Wednesday, a Senate subcommittee is meeting to talk about untested rape kits. I mean, what is it realistically that the federal government can do here, since really it's the states that make the laws that govern these investigations? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, last year, for the first time ever, the federal government created a fund of $41 million to help communities, not just with testing rape kits, but with investigating and prosecuting the leads in the cases that come out of testing those kits. And that has been a real resource gap for these communities. So this fund uh, just closed in May and uh, communities across the country applied for that funding. So that will be coming out soon. Um, and we're hopeful, um, we do have 41 in the budget, 41 million in the budget for next year and we are seeing movement on that. We're hopeful that that comes through again as another um, investment in change across the country for localities so that they can apply and get this 
get the funding and then do um, not only the testing, but create a community-based approach and a coordinated approach to these cases as they move from investigation to prosecution. Surprising numbers, but an important issue. Elsa mm -hmm. Connect, thank you so much for Thank being you. With us. Thank you very much.